All right, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Um, our organizer, Sarah Coltoon from the American Liver Foundation is uh, boarding a flight soon. So it might be a little noisy if she tries to come into the webinar. So I will go ahead and just introduce myself and the presentation and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who is, this is your first webinar, know that at the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity to ask questions and you can type any questions that you might have um, into the uh, box labeled chat on the browser window that you see on the right hand side of your screen and then type your message at the bottom and, and send those in and I will try to answer those as time uh, allows. So my name is Dr. Lisa Van Wagner. I am an assistant professor of medicine and preventive medicine in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology here at Northwestern University in downtown Chicago and today we're going to talk about fatty liver disease and prevention. So these are my disclosures. So in this webinar, we're going to define the causes of fat in the liver. We'll then describe the epidemiology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. We'll define some of the risk factors for NAFLD, and we'll then explain how NAFLD is diagnosed. And then we'll importantly talk about five ways in which you can prevent NAFLD. So the first thing is, what is a fatty liver? So, Having some fat in your liver is actually normal, but if it makes up more than 5% of your organ's weight, then you may actually have fatty liver disease. So if you look at this slide here, you can see on the left-hand picture what a normal liver looks like under a microscope. There are nice, evenly sized pink cells in the liver, which are known as hepatocytes, and those have a dark, uh, pink stained circle in the middle, as you can see with the arrow that I'm pointing here, and that's the nucleus of the cell. So here's the hepatocyte, the light pink area that's surrounded by those white areas, and this is the nucleus. When fat droplets begin to develop, as you can see on this side here, this is the white clear area, um, those nuclei get pushed over to the side. You can see here that the nucleus is very small in all of these pictures, and it moves all of the fluid in the cell, known as the cytoplasm, off to the side, and that can cause damage to the liver over time, and the liver can get very angry. So again, the definition of fatty liver is if more than 5% of your liver has fat in it, then you are thought to have fatty liver, and your liver, as a result, can get big, as you can see here in this picture. So if 5% of the liver or more is called fatty liver, well, what is the cause of getting fat in your liver to begin with? Well, the most common cause of a fatty liver is alcohol. And about 30% of people who have fat in their liver is due to alcohol. And that can be people who may have a diagnosis of having actual alcoholism, or it could just be um, people who have uh, moderate levels of alcohol use that can get fat in their liver. And if you stop drinking, that fat will actually go away. The second most common cause of fatty liver, and it's nearly as common as alcohol, is something known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. And another third of patients who have fat in their liver, it's due to this entity, and that's what we're really gonna focus on in this presentation. There are other more rare causes of having fat in your liver, and those include certain medications, um, chronic diseases like hepatitis C and autoimmune liver disease, um, as well as extreme weight changes like malnutrition um, or having weight loss surgery or even um, having histories of celiac disease. And then in pregnancy, there's a very rare disorder that can also cause fat in the liver. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD is an epidemic. And there's about 30% of all US adults and about 80% of adults who are obese have a diagnosis of NAFLD. And importantly, it's starting to affect our children as well. About 15% of the children in the United States have a diagnosis of NAFLD. It's important to know that when we use the term NAFLD in medical literature, we're talking about a range of diseases. And these can range from just having isolated fat in your liver, which is what I showed you on that prior slide, or you can have fat plus inflammation of the liver, which is termed non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH. It's this condition that can lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer, um, as well as the need for potentially liver transplantation. It's important to know that having fat in your liver with or without inflammation increases your risk of death. 
And the most common cause of death among people who have NAPLES is actually heart disease, followed by cancer. And third is actually liver-related death. So when you look at this, this makes plays a huge role in how we manage and prevent fatty liver disease is what actually causes poor outcomes in this disease. So along these lines, there are several specific risk factors for the development of NAFLD. And the most common one is obesity, and particularly a kind of obesity that forms in the central part of the bottom, sorry, in, of the body or in the abdomen called central adiposity. Insulin resistance, as well as type 2 diabetes, are risk factors for NAFLD. Problems with your blood cholesterol, your lipids, specifically high triglyceride levels or low um, high-density lipoprotein or HDL, which is that healthy cholesterol, low levels of that are associated with NAFLD, as well as high blood pressure is associated with NAFLD. And when you take all these conditions into consideration together, the term we give this in the medical literature is something known as the metabolic syndrome. And that's really the constellation of all of these different symptoms and disease states in one that we know is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So it is important to note that NAFLD affects more than just the liver. In particular, NAFLD has been associated with all of the conditions that are shown here. Now, some of these conditions are risk factors for the development of NAFLD, and some, such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease, have been shown to worsen when NAFLD is present. As we discussed previously, the most common cause of death and complications in NAFLD are actually heart disease, followed by cancer. And these are the main areas that NAFLD treatment and prevention really focuses on. I do want to mention that NAFLD is a silent disease. In one population study of about 2,700 U.S. participants, 24% had fatty liver on imaging, but only 2% of people, or basically 15 people, knew that they had a diagnosis of fatty liver disease. So it's often undiagnosed, which means we often don't know that people have the disease until severe symptoms start to develop. So how is NAFLD diagnosed? Well, the first is by physical exam and a medical history by your physician. Sometimes you can actually feel that enlarged liver, but that can also be very difficult to feel on exam because as I said, a lot of people who have this disease are overweight, particularly in the belly, and it can be hard to feel the liver when there's extra abdominal fat present. Your practitioner should also talk to you and ask you about different medical risk factors that might put you at risk for fatty liver disease, like diabetes. They should also ask you about your family history of having any liver disease in your family. There is a genetic predisposition to developing fat in the liver, um, though it's not completely inherited, meaning that just because you might have a diagnosis of fatty liver, it does not mean your children will have it, per se. Um, alcohol and medication use history are also very important because we want to make sure we're not missing other causes of fatty liver. We'll also run some blood tests and things that could tip us off to the fact that fat in the liver might be present uh, would be high liver enzymes, particularly the AST and the ALT number on a liver panel. And then we also want to make sure we've ruled out other causes of liver fat. So we want to test for things like hepatitis C and autoimmune liver diseases. And then the way that most fatty liver is detected is by an imaging test. And the most common is by ultrasound, and many people have probably had this done. It's a non-invasive method of looking at the belly um, using just a probe um, and radio frequency waves to look at the density of the things that are within the belly. You can also detect fat on a CT scan or a CAT scan, and sometimes that's how people are told that they have fatty liver because they had a CT scan for another reason, because they had abdominal pain or something else, and then it's incidentally found that they have fat in their liver. An MRI scan can also show fat in the liver, though it needs to be a special type of MRI scan um, that's usually available um, at specific centers like universities or research centers. Um, and it's actually the best way to look for fat in the liver if you're using these special kind of protocols. 
And then the last test I want to mention is something called a fibro scan. This is a newer test over the past five years that's becoming um, more and more highly used by liver specialists like myself, as well as gastroenterologists. And this can detect fat in the liver, um, again, using radio frequency waves similar to ultrasound, but it can also help us detect whether or not some scarring has developed in the liver. And so that's a very nice tool if you're being referred to a liver specialist, um, something to think about or ask whether or not that that test is available to you. But I do importantly want to mention that the gold standard and really the only way to know with, with reasonable certainty that you have uh, fatty liver disease and as well as to assess the severity of your fatty liver disease is really to perform a liver biopsy. And now this isn't of course ideal um, because there are some small risks associated with liver biopsy, but it's often what your uh, hepatologists or gastroenterologists will eventually recommend depending on whether or not they think you have significant uh, progression of your liver disease in order to help know how much damage has been done. So how can I prevent NAFLD? And that's really going to be the second half of this talk. Well, the first thing you can do to prevent NAFLD is to lose weight um, and eat healthy and to exercise. And I wish there was another way for me to say it, um, and I wish there was a magic pill to give everybody, but there isn't. And so I want to specifically focus on what's a safe weight loss goal. Well, we know from a lot of studies that have been done looking at weight loss and fat in the liver that if you can lose 10% of your total body weight, that you will have significant improvement in the amount of fat that's in the liver, as well as the amount of inflammation that has occurred in the liver as a result of the fat. The safe weight rate of weight loss that we recommend is about one to two pounds per week any more than that, and you might actually put yourself at risk for worsening of your fatty liver. So it's very important to stay um, at a healthy weight um, and lose weight at a healthy rate. So how do we do this? Um, I do wanna refer you last week, I gave a webinar on weight loss and exercise tips, and that's available on the American Liver Foundation website, and you can go there for more detailed sort of tips and, and tricks for weight loss. Um, but basic guidelines for NAPL prevention include following a Mediterranean type diet, which consists of things like nuts, fruits, vegetables, olive oil, fish, and legumes or beans. You want to avoid sugary foods. Um, there's been a lot of studies that have been done looking at fructose or high fructose corn syrup, things that we find a lot in our American processed food, um, soft drinks and sugar sweetened beverages. Those things have been linked to a higher risk of not just getting fat in your liver, but the more severe forms like NASH. You also want to try to reduce your carbohydrate intake. Ideally, you'd like to keep the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating as less than 50% of your total calories. So you want to fill up on things like fruits and vegetables, um, as well as on healthy, lean meats and proteins. And you want to avoid saturated and trans fats. And I'm sure many of us have noticed over the past 10 years that the um, Food and Drug Administration has really paid attention to how saturated and trans fats have affected the American diet. And there's now specific labels on all of our foods to actually tell us how much saturated and trans fats are in our foods. So just start by reading the backs of some of the labels to find out what's in the food that you're eating. And in general, my rule of thumb is if you can eat a whole piece of food, meaning something that hasn't been processed and prepackaged for you, you're going to be better off than buying pre-done um, you know, frozen meals, canned foods, um, processed types, drinks, and those kind of things. The second half of this, of course, is exercise. And exercise, of course, can lead to weight loss, but it's important to know that there's been a lot of studies that have shown that exercise improves liver fat even without weight loss. And it's recommended that you participate in both aerobic exercise, so things that get the heart rate pumping, as well as resistance training. And the recommendation from the Centers for Disease Control is that you participate in at least 30 minutes of physical activity per day on most days of the week. And that averages to about two hours and, and 20 minutes uh, during your week, which is about the same as watching a movie on the I also want to note that you don't have to do this 30 minutes all at one time. You can do break this up into 10 minute intervals and you'll still see the same benefits. So the second way that you can prevent NAPLD is get some sleep. 
There's been studies now that have shown that short sleep duration or sleeping less than seven hours of night, as well as poor sleep quality are associated with an increased risk of developing fatty liver disease. In addition, NAFLD is also associated with something known as obstructive sleep apnea, which is basically means that when somebody sleeps that they're losing oxygen both to their brain and to their liver because their airway is becoming obstructed in the middle of the night. There are specific tests that can be done to look at whether or not you have obstructive sleep apnea, so it's important to, to talk to your physician about whether or not they think you might be at risk for this condition. Also, in advanced liver disease, particularly cirrhosis, sleep disturbance can be an early sign of brain injury that could be occurring from your liver disease, and the medical term we use for that is hepatic encephalopathy. So if you're someone who's been diagnosed or your loved one's been diagnosed with chronic liver disease that might have scarring that could be leading to cirrhosis and you're starting to develop difficulty sleeping or insomnia or find that you're napping a lot during the day but up all night, it's important that you let your physician know about that because that could be an early sign of problems of your, this, your liver. In general, if you're having trouble sleeping, it's just really important that you talk to your physician about it. The third thing that you can do to prevent uh, NAFLD is to understand and control the medical risk factors. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about the different things that can lead to NAFLD, and so it's important that you know what your risk factors are. So talk to your doctor. If you have diabetes or a family history of diabetes, make sure that you're getting your blood sugars checked once a year. And if you have a diagnosis of diabetes, it's important to know your numbers. Something called the hemoglobin A1C level is a measure of how well your sugar is controlled over a couple of months. And it's important to know that number because there's guidelines for us as to how well your sugar is controlled if we can get that number below a certain level. And we usually say below 7%. The same thing goes for cholesterol. Know your numbers. Make sure that you're getting tested um, every year if you have risk factors for high cholesterol or have a diagnosis of high cholesterol, um, and if not, every, um, every couple of years if you don't have any risk factors. And then finally, blood pressure. Make sure that you are checking your blood pressure when you go to your doctor's office. You can also buy a home blood pressure cuff um, and check your, your blood pressure at home once a day. Um, and well as keep a log to bring that to your physician's office. And that can be very helpful for your doctor in helping to decide whether or not there's any interventions that need to be done in order to lower your blood pressure. The fourth thing you can do to prevent NAFLD is to avoid toxic substances. And what do I mean by that? Well, no liver talk would be complete without talking about alcohol. And so the recommendation really is, is to avoid all alcohol if you can, particularly if you have a diagnosis of chronic liver disease or you have a diagnosis of NAFLD. But even if you don't, it's important to use alcohol responsibly and to drink in moderation. And again, I refer you back to a talk that I did last week that talks more specifically about how much alcohol um, is okay um, or thought to be safe to be drinking in order to not develop fatty liver disease. But in general, we say less than, no more than one drink a day for women and no more than two drinks a day for men. It's also important that you know your medications and that you bring your medications or an accurate list of your medications with you to all your physician appointments. I find it very helpful um, if you have a smartphone. There are apps you can download that will keep track and let you keep track of your medications and changes. But if nothing else, just keep a little card um, in your wallet with you at all times so that you can give that to your practitioners when they need it. The other thing that I'll mention is it's very important that you use acetaminophen sparingly. Acetaminophen is also known as Tylenol, and you might be taking more than you realize. Acetaminophen is found not only in Tylenol, but it's found in cold medicines like Alka-Seltzer and NyQuil and Theraflu. Um, it's also found in prescription pain pills like Norco and Vicodin and Percocet. Acetaminophen has major interactions with alcohol, so you absolutely should not be drinking alcohol while taking the substance. And it's important that you know what the maximum dose you can be taking in 24 hours is. If you have no liver disease at all, then less than three grams in a 24 hour period is okay. If you have a diagnosis of liver disease or fatty liver disease, you should not have more than two grams of Tylenol in a 24 hour period, and that's very important. And then finally, I hope this goes without saying, but don't smoke. Um, smoking is associated with poor health outcomes in general, but it has also been shown to uh, worsen outcomes in patients with have, who have liver disease as well. 
So the fifth thing you can do to try to prevent NAFLD is to drink coffee. So interesting, after telling you all the things that you can't do, now I'm going to tell you it's okay to have, be addicted to that cup of coffee every day, and here's why. Coffee has been associated with reduced liver enzymes, lower severity of liver diseases, and lower rates of liver disease progression, and lower rates of incident liver cancer and chronic liver disease. So how much coffee are we talking about? Well, in the studies that have been done, looking at if you drink two to three cups of caffeinated black coffee a day, you'll have a 38% reduced risk of liver cancer and a 46% reduced risk um, in liver disease deaths. If you drink greater than four cups of coffee a day, you'll reduce your risk for liver cancer by 41% and your risk of liver disease deaths by 71%. And why is this so? Well, there's been a lot of research into why this is, we're seeing this in epidemiologic studies, but they've looked at caffeine and other chemicals that are in coffee. Um, and it's important to know that we don't see a large effect with decaf coffee, um, but you do see some effect. But importantly, there's no effect with other caffeinated beverages. So it doesn't work if you drink tea um, or espresso or drink Coca-Cola, which again, I mentioned, I don't want you drinking Coca-Cola. So what we recommend is moderate daily unsweetened caffeinated coffee. And depending on, on how much you, know, you can tolerate, um, we would say somewhere around that four cup a day mark um, if, if you don't have problems with heart palpitations or, or having stomach upset from drinking that coffee. So I know this question gets asked and it got asked last week during uh, the webinar as well. What about dietary supplements for, for NAFLD in, in particular? And I always say this, it's really, really important before you start any sort of herbal or supplement that you talk with your doctor first. But I'm gonna mention just three supplements that have been looked at that if you're doing Google searches about fatty liver disease that these are going to pop up. And the first one is the role of omega-3 fatty acids. This is found in cold water fish such as salmon, fish oils, flax and flax seed oils, um, as well as walnuts. And this has been shown to reduce liver inflammation as well as to improve fat. The important caution here is that there is one study that came out in a high quality journal within the last year that showed in people who have diabetes, um, which is a significant proportion of people who have NAFLD, it can actually worsen the insulin resistance. And so really larger studies need to be done to see whether or not omega-3 fatty acids supplementation in addition to what's in your normal diet is actually safe and beneficial for use in NAFLD. So I encourage you to eat these types of foods. That's really part of that Mediterranean diet that we talked about. But whether or not taking omega-3 fatty acids on top of, of a healthy diet is going to have any benefit um, is really unknown. And if you have diabetes, I probably would uh, consider talking your physician about steering away from any uh, omega-3 supplements. The second one I'll mention is vitamin E. This is found in almonds, spinach, avocado, um, olives, particularly green olives. Uh, bell peppers, sunflower seeds, pine nuts, and papaya. And this has been shown to improve liver enzymes and liver inflammation across multiple studies now. The important thing to note about vitamin E is that it comes in several different forms. And the kind that you can get over the counter and take on your own is actually not the form that's most active or has been studied in NAFLD. The formulation that's specifically been studied in NAFLD is a prescription form. It's called the D formulation. And it's a pretty high dose of 400 international units that needs to be taken twice a day. This should only be taken under the care of a physician and particularly a liver specialist because there have been studies that have shown that taking high doses of vitamin E, so greater than 400 units a day, has a small, very small increased risk of cardiovascular death. Um, as well as an increased risk of prostate cancer in men. So this is a discussion that you really need to have with your physician about whether or not for your disease, vitamin E is the right choice uh, for possible treatment. Um, but I would not recommend uh, uh, taking additional vitamin E just for primary prevention of, of fatty liver disease. And the last one I'll mention is milk thistle. This is uh, also called a Silibum marinium or silimarin. Um, are the active ingredients in milk thistle. And this has been shown to potentially improve liver regeneration in some very small studies that have been done. Um, really, there's just not enough research at this point uh, for us to recommend this as any sort of treatment for NAFLD. It's pretty well tolerated, um, but there have been a lot of reports and I've seen patients who get very severe diarrhea when taking milk thistle. So again, if you're considering wanting to use this, 
um, you really need to talk to your to your physician about whether or not they think it's safe in your case. So in summary, to prevent and improve NAFLD, you need to maintain a healthy weight through diet and exercise. You need to sleep. And um, if you're having problems sleeping, it's important you talk to your physician. You need to control your medical risk factors. You need to avoid toxins and go ahead and drink that morning coffee. I didn't talk about treatment during this talk since we were focused on prevention, um, but I will note that there is no FDA approved medication for NAFLD at this time. However, there are greater than 250 clinical trials that are underway, and you can see some of those at clinicaltrials.gov. And if you are not, if you have a diagnosis or your loved one has a diagnosis of fatty liver disease and you have not been referred to a, a liver specialist um, at one of uh, major centers that has clinical trials going on, um, consider talking to your physician about whether that might be appropriate for you. I can personally say here at Northwestern, uh, we have about 15 different trials that are going on uh, for fatty liver disease. And if you're interested in more information about any of those or whether you might be a candidate for any of those, you can at my email, uh, which is at the end of this talk. So in summary, there are multiple causes of fatty liver. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is an epidemic, and it's a silent disease that will increase your risk of death. NAFLD is related to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, as well as abnormal blood lipids. And NAFLD prevention and treatment is centered on maintaining a healthy lifestyle. So I thank you all for your attention during your lunch hour today, and then I welcome any questions that anyone might have. Remember, you can go ahead and type any questions that you have into that message box there. And again, I have also put my email on here if anyone's interested in um, contacting me for more information on clinical trials, um, or if you have any questions about this talk, I'm also happy to talk, talk with you via email. Anyone have any questions? All right, I'm not seeing anything from anyone. So if no one has any questions, um, thank you very much to everyone for your time. Um, and I encourage you to check out the American Liver Foundation Great Lakes chapter webpage for information on the next set of webinars, which I believe are on liver transplantation and will be um, occurring in April this month. So. Thank you. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.